um, the Northwest Paper 2018 you were busy with. You completed the Northwest Paper of 2018, Paper 2. And you would also have noticed that I might have um, used some of these questions in the test for Friday. So it's always good. Look, at the end of the year, you've got to remember that if you go through your past papers, you add a lot of material. You go through a lot of material that's going to be asked anyway. So just be aware of that. So uh, if you go through past papers, that's the best way to study. And that's what we're doing at the moment. We're going through one, uh, as many past papers as possible. But it's no use just going through the paper and the memo. You need to understand why the answers are the way they are. You need to understand the background. So you need to know the work and then you test yourself and you assess, do I now know the work? So when I discuss these questions, I'm going to discuss with you guys why it's the way it is. Not just that it is like that, the why it's that way. I just want to switch off my camera completely. There we go. Okay, so you should be, you should be seeing, um, you should be seeing the paper in front of you now. I'm going to go through it question by question. I'm just going to close it. There we go. So 1.1.1 says, a trait that has a range of phenotypes is an example of complete dominance, discontinuous variation, continuous variation, or co-dominance. And as I told you guys before, you need to know the terminology around genetics very well to be able to do genetics questions. So let's quickly go through what each of these means. Uh, so continuous variation, that has to do with evolution. Um, and so you had, you had to study, before we went into human evolution, you had to study, you had to redo the background that you did in grade 10 with normal evolution. And so here's an example of continuous variation and discontinuous variation. With continuous variation, uh, it could be, for example, height. So we're going to get some people that are nice and short, and you're going to get some people that are very tall, and those are the people that are tall. And so there's a range of heights. And so that's, that's a typical continuous variation. When we don't have continuous variation, what do we have? We have just in between. There's no range you have distinctive uh, blocks. This could be, for example, eye color. Eye color shows continuous variation. Let me just quickly double check if there's not anything going wrong here. No. Okay, that's fine. Um, okay, so that could be eye color. So this would be brown eye color. This could be blue eye color. And then some people have like, green eyes. Uh, so that's con a discontinuous variation. There's no range of colors. It's, it's very distinctive, either this or that. It's not like height where you can be a range of different heights as soon as you have an adult. Um, then the other one that this, that I mentioned here is co-dominance and complete dominance. And so we have to know the difference between co-complete and incomplete dominance. And I just want to go through this again very quickly. So remember, there's a genotype. This is the genotype. And a genotype shows the genes. It means that I can have a blue gene and a yellow gene. Doesn't mean I'm going to be blue or yellow. It just means that I have that gene within my body. Now, with what we find over here with complete dominance is that a blue, in this case, is dominant over yellow. So if I have the blue gene like over here, this person has a blue gene and a yellow gene, but it turns out to be blue because it's complete dominance. Blue dominates yellow. With co-dominance, what we find is that there's no, uh, there's no recessive or dominant gene. And when we have a blue and a yellow gene, what happens is that it shows both. It shows blue and yellow. With incomplete dominance, what we find is we there's a middle path. So if I have got both blue genes, both alleles is coding for blue, then I'm going to be blue. If both alleles are coding for yellow, I'm going to be yellow. 
But if I have the blue gene and the yellow gene, it's going to be in between blue and yellow, which in this case is green. No, what is complete dominance? What is co-dominance? What is incomplete dominance? In this case, the answer to this question, ladies and gentlemen, this is go through the question again before we answer it. A genetic cross where two pairs of con there's two pairs of contrasting, sorry, two pairs of contrasting characteristics. Okay, so contrasting characteristics on different homologous chromosomes are investigated. And so I'm, I'm this in this case it's a I'm looking at two different characteristics. We could be looking at something like, uh, for example, um, ear lobes attached and disattached, and we could be looking at eye color. So we're taking a look at two genetic features, and this is what we get in a dye hybrid cross. Um, ladies and gentlemen, in a dye hybrid cross, this is a typical example of a dye hybrid cross. So in a dye hybrid cross, in this case, I'm looking at two features. What features am I looking at? I'm looking at yellow, apologies, I'm looking at yellow seeds and I'm looking at green seeds. So that is the one feature I'm looking at. I'm also looking at smooth seeds, smooth seeds and I'm looking at wrinkled seeds. So it's two the distinctive features I'm looking at. And that's when we get a dihybrid cross. Now we haven't had much practice with dihybrid crosses here. And I think I should make a video for you guys specifically explaining dihybrid crosses or going into that in detail. Because there is another question in this paper that goes through dihybrid crosses. But we're not gonna go through that question today. All that I'm telling you is uh, it's not a mono hybrid cross where mono meaning one, where I only take a look at one feature. Where I only take a look at color of seed or I only take a look at texture of seeds. I am taking a look, ladies and gentlemen, at both. I'm taking a look, are they yellow or green? And I'm taking a look at, are they smooth or wrinkled? Okay, now, that's then a dye hybrid cross, a dye hybrid cross. So it's not a mono hybrid cross, we only take a look at one feature, um, and then also with, um, it's not a heterozygous cross, okay? Heterozygous cross means that when I'm crossing, uh, for example, in that example that I gave, we, we normally do it with a monohybrid cross. I be, could be crossing a uh, yellow seeds, apologies, yellow seeds with yellow, seed, uh, yellow seeds, but both of them over there, they have genes for both yellow and green. So that's heterozygous, heterozygous. And then what do we get with co-dominance? We talked about co-dominance. Co-dominance, ladies and gentlemen, is where I have, when, when it's phenotypically, when I take a look at the phenotype, the phenotype shows me that there's, there's both, both show. It's not like a complete dominance where the blue shows, even if I have the yellow gene. So it doesn't completely, uh, com uh, completely discuss 1.1.1 with you, the answer. The answer there was continuous variation because uh, continuous variation I had, it said to me, there's a range of phenotypes. The moment you hear a range of phenotypes, I know it's continuous variation. So that's 1.1.1 and 1.1.2. Let's go on to 1.1.3. Now, they typically talk about that heterozygous cross <laughs> in the next question. So if two animals are heterozygous for a particular characteristic and are mated, what will the probable ratio of the phenotypes of the F1 generation be? Let's take a look. Let's do a quick cross. Okay, so let's do the example that they just gave us now. Uh, or let's go use the blue brown eye example. So heterozygous, capital B, small letter B, capital B, small letter B, we're crossing there. Okay, so that's a heterozygous. Why is it heterozygous? Hetero means different, so different genes, different alleles, uh, or different genes of the same, uh, different alleles of the same gene. So let's cross them on a planet square very quickly. So capital B, small letter B, capital B, small letter B. 
So over here, I'm gonna have capital B, capital B. I'm gonna have capital B, small letter B, capital B, small letter B, small letter B, small letter B. Blue, 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 blue. Uh, uh, sorry, brown, 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 because B, brown, B. Um, let's make that brown rather, because um, I don't want to confuse you guys in terms of eye color dominance. With eye color dominance, and I don't have a brown color here, but I'm just going to use orange for it. So with eye color, brown is dominant, blue is recessive. So that's going to be brown, 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 brown. And our last one, the small letter B, small letter B only has recessive genes, so that's going to be blue. Okay, so ratio 1, 2, 3 to 1. A ratio of 3 to 1 when I have a heterozygous cross. And so the answer to 1.1.3, ladies and gentlemen, is C. 1.1.3 is C because it's a 3 to 1 ratio when I have a heterozygous cross. And remember, when we're specifically talking about this, I'm talking about complete dominance, complete dominance. Let's move on to question 1.1.4. Which one of the following statements below is an acceptable explanation based on the theory of punctuated equilibrium? Okay, so let's just take a look at first. What is punctuated equilibrium? Punctuated equilibrium, ladies and gentlemen, says to me that there was a sudden change in the environment, like over there. There was a sudden change in the environment. And the sudden change in the environment led to some variations starting to show that didn't previously show. So the genes changed because the environment changed. And it's a sudden change. So for many, many years, there was no change. No, nothing, not a happen. And then a sudden change in the environment and suddenly uh, it catered for um, different variations. And then we call this punctuated equilibrium. As opposed to what we call gradualism. Now, Darwin only, only recognized gradualism. He didn't know about punctuated equilibrium yet. So he said, no, there's a variation happening. And this variation happens over a long period of time. And there's no sudden changes in the environment that is catering for um, uh, the change in the genes. He didn't know about genes or the change in the phenotype. So things change gradually. And that's why they call it gradualism. As opposed to punctuated, there's points in between, punctuated equilibrium. Okay, so in this case, let's take a look at the question. Which one of the following statements below is an acceptable explanation based on the theory of punctuated equilibrium? A, unicellular organs become more complex as the environment change. Okay, that's, mm, yes, it could work. Not probably not the most correct answer, but yeah, I, I can suit, um, um, I can suit this to punctuated equilibrium. Gradual, no gradual, no, uh, no gradual. So this is not punctuated equilibrium. Gradual evolutionary changes in the phenotype result in speciation. That's gradualism. C, species constantly change. No, there was no constant change. It's a sudden change with punctuated equilibrium. New species are formed and others become extinct. And that's gradualism. Okay, it's not saying it's not true. It's just saying that punctuated equilibrium is not saying that. So let's take a look at, uh, at, at the last one. There's long periods in the fossil records where species remain unchanged. Yes, D, D is the correct answer. Because there's long periods where there's no change whatsoever. And then there's a sudden change that happens. Let's take a look at 1.1.5. And just before we do that, I just want to make sure that nobody is feeling left out. Oh, J1 is feeling left out because I'm not letting him in at the moment. Okay. So we just let J in quickly. Then we'll continue. Okay, nobody else. Okay, let's continue. So the next question is actually the difference between archaeology, showing the difference between archaeology 
um, and anthropology uh, and paleontology and what we also would call paleoanthropology. It says to us, with one of the following serves as evidence of cultural, cultural evolution of the homo species. Cultural, not, not the gene difference, the, the, the difference in, in activities that they did. So, let's just go through the different diagrams I have here, then I'll show you. And I have some diagrams here. Where did I put those diagrams? Okay, and now unfortunately for some reason, uh, here we go. Um, uh, so this is typical of, uh, sorry, it was discussed in another question. So this is paleontology. This is not, this is not cultural differences. Let's go back to that question, 1.1.5. So drawings and carvings on rocks. Okay, so that's a cultural thing we do. Uh, art is a cultural thing that we do. And so that's part of cultural evolution. So the correct answer for this one is A, but I just want to quickly double check that the rest is not maybe also correct answers. B says animal remains find close to a homo skeleton. No, that can't be culture. Why? Because it could mean several things. I could have ate, eaten the animal and the bones were left there. Okay, so and, and any animal that eats, whether he's got a culture or not, he, would have, he could have left uh, other animal bones around him when he, uh, any carnivore could have left other animal bones around him. Secondly, male and female skeletons found in the same area does not mean that there's a cultural thing to it. Males and females come together and do many things. That's not cultural. Um, I'm not going to go into that, but they do. But yes, they can do many things that are not cultural. Um, and all animals do them. And then, the last one says, more than one homo skeleton found in the same area. No, it just means that there was a population. Many animals congregate together in groups without having cultural activities, without doing cultural activities. A pride of lions um, would also then qualify. And they don't have any culture that they, uh, that they show. Let's go on to 1.1.6, ladies and gentlemen. 1.1.6, similar structures with the same body plan that performs different functions in different animals. Okay, so now again, you've got to know. You have to know. I just want to see there's a message that came through. Okay. No, it's nothing about the group and anybody that's want to join, so that's fine. Let me just see if there's any participants that still want to join up here. No. Okay, let's continue. So again, when we're busy with genetics, ladies and gentlemen, and when we're busy with evolution, which the two are related to one another, we need to know, we need to know our terminology very well. Otherwise, we're not going to do well in these questions. So similar structures of the same body plan that perform different functions are um, heterozygous, or homozygous. No, 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 no. This is yetro or homozygous. Let me show you. Yetrozygous, dominant, dominant. Um, and uh, so homozygous, dominant, dominant. Homozygous, recessive, recessive. Yetrozygous means I have both genes of the same allele. Okay. Um, and so that's yetrozygous. Then analogous. What's analogous? Analogous structures. Okay. So analogous structures is, for example, the wing. Um, you find wings on birds and you find wings on bees. Uh, and these two are not evolutionary related to one another. They're not made out of the same structures. They're not made out of the same materials, um, but they do do the same function. And so that's analogous structures. And then the, one that the other one that they give here is homologous structures. So homologous structures is typical of our arm and the bones in our arm, we can find the very same bones in the, the leg of a cat. We can find the same structures in the wing of a, a bird and we can find the very same, those very same bones in the flipper of a, a whale. And so those are homologous structures. They have a common ancestor and then as we evolved, these structures became different to better suit our environment. And so those are 
homologous structures? So the correct answer to question six is D, homologous. Then ladies and gentlemen, 1.1.7. The evidence of the idea that all living organisms have a common ancestor because their molecular composition are, or their molecular composition are very similar. Okay, so when the moment I say molecular composition of an animal, uh, I start thinking genetics. And so the answer to this is genetics. And so over here, I can see how we compare, uh, for example, the um, human uh, genes to the genes of other great apes like the chimpanzee or the gorilla and how similar they are to one another. So genetics, it show that it doesn't show that I came from an ape. It doesn't show that I came from a gorilla or that I came from a chimpanzee. It just shows that we have a common ancestor. So our great, 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 great granddaddy, he he, ha he was the, the, the great granddaddy of both the chimpanzee as well as us. And we can see that in the matching up of the genes. Okay, then let's just go through the other um, theory, other words here that we know what they mean. Comparative embryology. So that's we find evolution. We find that if we take a look at the embryos of all of these animals, whether they are fish on this side, whether they are a pig over there or a cat over there or a human over there. The embryos look the same. At the very start, at the very beginning of each embryo, as they grow within the egg or as they grow within the, uh, the uterus of mommy, we find that they look the same. And then as as they develop, they start looking different. Then the other one says comparative biogeography. So comparative biogeography means that I find certain animals like on the eastern side of South America and then especially on the western side of Africa, we find similar animals. Um, and here we, we have um, uh, the flightless birds, as an example, like the rhea and the ostrich, we find in different continents, and they said we had they had a uh, they had a common ancestor um, uh, to, for example, the emo. So this was when all of these continents were together, still part of Pangaea. Then there was a common ancestor for them, and as the continents split, they started to evolve differently. Then from there. Paleontology. So paleontology is when I specifically take a look at and I, I, I dig up bones and I take a look at the remains of, of animals and plants and organisms and because of those remains I can then relate them to how these organisms evolved. 1.1.8 1 In a family of four children each child has a different blood group. With respect to the ABO blood group system for humans, the genotypes of the parents, and now I must remember what, how I'm going to get my blood groups here. In blood groups, I've got three distinctive blood groups, but they're controlled by different genes, and two of these genes are completely dominant over the other one, but co-dominant with regards to one another. So IA and IB is co-dominant, but they are completely dominant over the recessive I gene. The I gene gives you the O, the A gene gives you A, and of course the B gene gives you B. So in this case, what we have here, ladies and gentlemen, with regard to 1.1.8, is that I've got, a, I've got a mom that's got a blood group of A, a dad with a blood group of B, but they both have the gene. They both have the gene for the blood group O. So when they have kids, what happened with the kids is that when we cross them, there's IA, there's IB, 
there's this monitor I, there's this monitor I. So it already had gone through. I'll just see if somebody's waiting here in the waiting room. No. They've already gone through my hostess now that we're going through fertilization. And we get I A I B over there. Where is this? Um, and that's type A B. Then I've got type A blood because A is dominant over I. So type A blood over there. Over there, I've got type B blood over there. So it's dominant over, because it's dominant over the O type blood. And over here, I've got one kid that's got both the recessive genes and he's a type blood O. Four kids, four different blood groups, and they don't match mommy and daddy. So if the parents don't understand why this is happening, you might think to, they might think to themselves, where has my hubby or where has my wife been? Okay. But now we know that that can happen because they, just because they don't, they're not a specific blood group doesn't mean that they don't have that blood group in their genotype. So, 1.1.9, study the following statements. Um, organisms in a population show a great deal of variation, okay? Uh, Characteristics are passed on from parents to offspring. Okay, no problem with that. If any organism uses an organ frequently and becomes more developed, yes, that's true. Okay, but that, that's not. Now I'm starting to see they're comparing Lamarck and Darwin over here. The Marxism and Darwinism here. And yes, I can, I can go and I can go to the gym and I can pump some iron and grow some muscle, but that. And that, that's what that means. If I use an organ frequently, it's going to become more developed. Um, it's not always true because even if I, um, for example, stretch my neck like a giraffe, and I love using the giraffe as an example of this, doesn't mean that my neck's going to become longer. And then the last one says a large number of offspring are produced, but only a few survive. Which one of the following combinations refers to the observations of Darwin? So which ones are Darwin and which ones are a mark? Number one was uh, Darwin, okay, there's variation. Number two, it's passed to offspring, yes. Number three, Darwin never stated this. Darwin never bothered about this. So this is not Darwin. And then the last one, a large number of offspring were produced, but only a few survived. Yes, that sounds like Darwin. And so one, two, and four is the correct answer. So your correct answer is C. Let's just quickly go through what Darwin and Lamarck said. Uh, Lamarck said, that if I, for example, um, inherited characteristics, so um, I would then stretch my necks like this giraffe, and because I'm stretching my necks, my necks are going to become longer, and I pass that the long neck gene onto my offspring. But that doesn't happen, and that's the problem with Lamarck, is that if we take a look at it, if I go to the gym and I pump the iron and I grow some muscle, I'm not going to have a baby that's going to come out and have muscle. So that doesn't happen. Okay, so um, that, that characteristics never gets passed on. While Darwin says, no, there's a great variation. There's some with long necks and some with short necks. The one with long necks are going to survive. One with short necks are not going to survive because they can't reach the leaves. And so who survives and who passes on their genes? The ones with the long necks. Let's go to the last question on today's uh, schedule. We only have a few minutes left anyway. In humans, brown eye color is dominant over blue eye color. A mother with blue eyes had children, uh, two children. One with a boy with brown eyes and a girl with blue eyes. The eye color of the father. Is it sex linked? No, this is not sex linked. Eye color is not sex linked. So that's not the correct answer. Then, the father's eyes had to be brown. Why? Because mommy's eyes was blue. And for her to have children with the dominant brown, daddy had to have brown eyes. Okay. And so let's quickly do the genetic cross on this. Okay. So phenotypes, uh, we have um, mom with blue eyes and we have dad with brown eyes. And we have a capital B. Oh, no. That's blue eyes. So that's a small letter B, small letter B. Let's do it. Small letter B, small letter B. Daddy with brown eyes. Okay, now in this case, he had to have a capital B. He's got brown eyes, but he's got a girl with blue eyes. 
so he's also got a smaller to be. Although he's going to have brown eyes, he's heterozygous brown. So let's cross them quickly before our time runs out. So there's my hostess happening. And small letter B, small letter B. There we go. That's going to be capital, sorry. Capital B, small letter B. Capital B, small letter B. Brown eyes, brown eyes. The bottom's going to be small letter B, small letter B, small letter B, small letter B. 50% brown, 50% blue eyes. And so that's why daddy has to have brown eyes. Okay. Um, with these questions, it's, be, it's best to have some, um, to work, work it out so you double sure, like I did over here. And remember, whenever you're doing these genetic crosses, to use this template that they give you, because the template already get, gets you some marks if they ask you uh, one of these crosses. 